first talk of this session is by uh, Natalie Battaglia talking about studying exoplanets with JWST. Um, Natalie and Don are together, the two sort of astro leads of the astrobiology nexus efforts that headquarters has. And of course, Natalie played a huge role in discovering and characterizing all the planets, many of the planets JWST will look at through her work on uh, the Kepler mission. So, Natalie. <laughs> Hey, Jeff, how's the volume? Is that okay? It's on, right? Uh, so there's a Natasha Battaglia in the field who's probably, well, we get our emails mixed up all the time. In fact, sometimes I'm even listed on papers with her name. Uh, thank goodness for ORC IDs. So I kind of suspected maybe she was the one that was supposed to be invited to give this talk. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I don't really do atmospheric studies, however, I found myself in the weird position of leading the team that's doing the web early release science observations for, what's that? <laughs> for tra okay, good, thanks, that makes me feel better. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to, my, my talk is somewhat biased in that regard, I'm going to be focusing on what we're doing with transiting exoplanets. And because the Early Science Release Program is, is observing giants, I'll be talking about hot Jupiters. Uh, but the focus of this conference, of course, is habitability. So I feel obliged to give a couple comments about the TRAPPIST system, because TRAPPIST stands alone in parameter space with regards to the objects that we have the hope of characterizing. And it's interesting, because maybe five years ago or so, when we did the first models simulating the instruments and their, be, and their performance, everybody came to the conclusion that we're not going to be able to characterize temperate uh, terrestrial-sized planets unless we get super lucky. Well, we did. We hit the jackpot. We got pretty much very lucky uh, with TRAPPIST. Uh, it stands alone for two reasons. It's orbiting an extremely cool star, 2,500 degree Kelvin which goes to Scott's point about the wide range of M dwarf properties. So its transits are deeper, they're easier to see, um, but the star itself, therefore, is like 19th magnitude in the optical. It's ridiculously faint, which would have made us completely dead in the water, except that it's a compact multi, which gave us transit timing variations, which allowed us to get the masses. And as Ty pointed out, those masses are really important for retrieving accurate atmospheric properties. So um, the current thinking is that we will be able to measure background gases, uh, the background gas in the, tr in the TRAPPIST planet atmospheres, and that's very exciting. It's a GTO target. Uh, Natasha could have told you all about that because she's on that GTO team. Sorry that she's not here. Okay, so transiting exoplanets and their atmospheres. Uh, we're talking about light streaming through the atmosphere on the limb as a planet transits the, the host star. This is maybe what you might see between one and five microns if you were actually there watching it happen. Um, this is what we see with Hubble. Apologies for the low luminosity. Um, Hubble captures a very, very tiny swath of wavelength space. Very, very small. The features there due to an atmosphere are predominantly water, not much else. So almost everything that we calculate about, atmos about atmospheres of planets is derived from water, water features. Maybe something about the Rayleigh slope in the blue. Um, here's what's been done with Hubble to date. And to be fair, I should also include or point out these broadband photometry-like points from Spitzer that are pinning our only data point in the infrared or out at five microns in that infrared. Um, so this is from the classic paper by David Singh, 2016, giving a compilation of Hubble observations of hot Jupiters. Uh, it's plotted on the x-axis logarithmically to make it look like Hubble gives us this really long wavelength swath when in fact, remember, it's just that tiny window. Um, the features there are, are water, as I mentioned. However, some alkali metals have also been detected with Hubble, namely potassium and sodium, as well as helium. Helium has been detected. Um, that's about it. 
for the abundance measures in the hot Jupiter atmospheres. What you're seeing here from David Singh is a progression from clear atmospheres down to cloudy atmospheres. And as it goes through that progression, the spectra get increasingly flat. Um, but you can also see that progression here as evidenced by the slope in the blue um, due to Rayleigh scattering. On the right, we have a progression of spectra, extracted spectra from Hubble of warm Neptunes from a paper by Ian Crossfield. And they go from HAP-P26, which to be fair, isn't really a Neptune. It's more like a Saturn. I think it's seven Earth radii, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the progression is in here. It's in equilibrium temperature going down to the famous flat line of GJ1214. Uh, GJ1214 also kind of stands alone in the parameter space of, in the discovery space of exoplanets in that it's orbiting a cool star. And likewise, it's very faint. The host star is about 15th magnitude in the optical. And I'll keep mentioning this point about these optical magnitudes. So what is it that we want to learn looking at these spectra? Well, if you read a lot of proposals for Hubble, you'll see some themes. We want to measure the metallicity, the mass metallicity correlation. That is the ratio between the abundance of everything else to hydrogen. Um, and uh, remember, I said that that's always inferred by looking only at water, right? Um, so keep that in mind. For our own solar system, there's this beautiful trend between metallicity and mass. You see the solar system planets are like beads on a string with that nice slope. And of course, that's very consistent with the core accretion models. Why is it consistent? Because core accretion models historically tried to explain the solar system. Now we know that, that it's, the situation is much, much more complex. So we want to measure many metallicities um, to fill out this diagram, not just for the hot Jupiters, but also for the temperate and cool Jupiters. We want to add them to that diagram. On the right-hand side, I mentioned C to O ratios. These are, this is another great diagnostic for planet formation and evolution because the condensation temperatures for different molecules is a function of how far away you are out in the disk. You expect different molecules to condense out at different distances. So by measuring the C to O ratio, it gives you some tip-off as to where the planet formed. Um, I'm including this diagram from Kepler because I think it's related to atmospheres. One of the great mysteries of Kepler is that the most common planet in the discovery space is a planet we don't have in our solar system, these, this gray area in between, which is the kind of super-Earth sub-Neptunes. We have evidence by measuring both radii from Kepler and masses from Doppler surveys that this part of the parameter space exhibits compositional diversity. We have high density planets, low density planets. We map them to isocomposition curves and that tells us that they have a large range of envelope mass fractions. And that's very interesting since we don't have one in our own solar system. We don't know what they are. Uh, the way that we're getting to this compositional diversity is through mass radius and density and isocomposition curves. But atmospheric study gives us another direct way, top down, of looking at compositional diversity because you're looking at the envelope, you're looking at the, either the primordial atmosphere or what's being outgassed or delivered to that planet. Um, so I think that these are two very complementary synergistic uh, methodologies for getting a handle on the gray area in between. Okay, so science drivers, I said abundances, beyond water, helium, and the alkali metals, mass metallicity relation beyond the hot Jupiters, C to O ratios, please, using carbon-bearing species. The C to O ratios in the literature are based on water. We need the carbon-bearing species, and those are actually out beyond the wavelength range of Hubble. So the broader wavelength range of Webb is going to be a boon for this. Uh, temperature pressure versus alti both altitude and longitude. This is another thing that we can do with Webb is probe the physical structure of the atmosphere in terms of temperature and pressure. Look for disequilibrium processes that might be going on. And as long as I'm mentioning disequilibrium, 
one of the ways or the primary way of looking for life is to look for disequilibrium processes, right? That could be due to life. We haven't yet ever been able to explain a disequilibrium process even in a brown dwarf, let alone a hot Jupiter, let alone an Earth-like planet. So a metered approach to getting to life is to search for disequilibrium processes, mixing, dredge up, quenching, circulation, these kinds of things that produce disequilibrium and being able to recognize it when we see it and being able to model it and understand the source, that will help us to fine tune our models that then later will allow us to interpret the disequilibrium characteristic of life. Okay, um, all right, so again, here we are with Hubble and this is what it's going to look like with Webb. We're going to span the entire wavelength range. We're going to have this window to many different species. And I'm actually only plotting one to five microns here. Webb will go out to 10 microns with MIRI as well. So we'll have CO2 species, um, methane, many different diagnostics. It's like when you're analyzing stellar atmospheres. You want a range of species with different potentials that probe different places in the atmosphere to get a broad understanding of what the atmosphere is doing. It's the same thing with planets. That ex extra wavelength range is really important. Okay, so now fast forward to, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, 2017-ish, I think it was. Way back in time, the Webb Advisory Committee recommended that space telescopes run an early science program. So, and, and it would be designed so that all of the data collected was non-proprietary. Everybody would have access to it. Moreover, the lucky souls who got to run those programs would be um, responsible for creating tools that they would hand off to the public. And they would be responsible for training the public. And the idea was Webb is only a five-year, baseline five-year mission, maybe 10 if all goes well. We're on a clock. It's not like Hubble where we will be able to service the mission. We're on a clock. So we want the community to hit the ground running, get trained, and know how to analyze the data as soon as possible to fully leverage this new resource. So they put this program, um, uh, they, they did an AO for this program. They ran this program. Uh, the community collected together through Nexus, um, through my hat as one of the co-leads of Nexus, we organized a working group. We got hundreds of scientists from all over the world participating in the brainstorming for this program. Uh, 13 programs were selected ultimately. Here's a, a few of them, and here are the others. There are two exoplanet early release proposals that were selected, one for direct imaging and one for transmission. Um, and if you add up the time from both of those, exoplanets got 25% of the allocation. A huge triumph for exoplanet science. So what are we going to do with this opportunity? Well, uh, what we wanted, what we aimed to do was tackle a diversity of phenomena with regards to transiting exoplanets. That is, we wanted to observe all of the different manifestations of transiting exoplanets, from a primary transit to a secondary eclipse, and even phase modulations that you can see for planets that have strong thermal emission. And so we proposed a program, and here's a cartoon showing all of those methods. Uh, so we proposed a program that did all three of these observations. So that was one goal. We also wanted the diversity of science. So all of the things that I've just mentioned, metallicity, C to O ratios, temperature pressure profiles, and even longitudinal temperature mapping to get a three-dimensional structure, which you can do with the phase curve, is on the docket. We also wanted to tackle an observing, uh, a diversity of observing modes. Here's a cartoon that summarizes all of the web instruments that are relevant for transiting exoplanet science. Um, we've got the wavelength coverage up here, the revo re revolution. The resolution is color-coded. Um, here are the different instruments, and we compare with Hubble to see the, the difference in wavelength coverage. 
Um, you can see that uh, there are these vertical bands that show that within a given instrument, there are various instrument modes. You can choose grisms, in, for example, to isolate certain wavelengths. Uh, you can also, for example, on near spec, choose a prism mode, which captures the entire uh, one to five micron wavelength space in one observation, in one data take, um, but at a resolution of something like 100, 50 to 100, or 70 or so. Um, but that's actually the mode that's going to be used for TRAPPIST. Remember Trappist is faint? Did I mention Trappist is faint? Yeah. Okay. So we wanted to um, tackle all of these observing modes, and we wanted to focus on targets that were previously observed with Hubble, targets that were not showing a flat spectrum, targets that had features, they have water features, implying that they have a clear atmosphere, which means we'll be able to see features in the spectrum, be guaranteed of that. Moreover, be able to compare what we do with Hubble or with Webb to what was done with Hubble, for example, in Spitzer. Um, so this is an example of WASP-63b as a target that we were going to observe. It was on our, our target list for a while, but then it was observed with Hubble, and we discovered that the features weren't that prominent. So we actually demoted it in priority and put another one in its place. Okay, so the first, so it, we have a three-pronged program. The first is the transmission program, this is the, the meat of the program, 42 hours out of, I think, 80 is the total. Uh, and here is a simulated spectra, spectrum of WASP-79b, which is our highest priority target. The model was generated, it, it's a forward model based on a set of parameters derived from the retrieval of a Hubble observation. Then that forward model is fed to a simulator, so you can see what the web data is expected to look like. Um, and so here, here is what that looks like. This is uh, a model that, well, the remarkable thing about this is after you simulate the data, now you can do retrievals on it and you can compare the posterior distributions or the information content from Web versus Hubble. And that's what's being shown on the right-hand side of the slide in the triangle plot. You see posterior distributions in red for two properties, um, the C to O ratio and the metallicity. And the red posteriors are a mess. They're, they're broad, you, you, you really, I mean, you're hard pressed to come up with a unique solution for the CDO ratio, for example. But with Webb, because we have this broader wavelength coverage and of course higher sensitivity, you see those posterior distributions just tighten right up. Nice, beautiful mode, Gaussian behavior. So that's what we're looking forward to with Webb. Um, so this is, in words, what we're going to be doing. Uh, you can read about this online or you can have my slides, um, but I think another diagram is more useful. This shows the wavelength coverage of the instrument modes that we're going to be utilizing. So they're color-coded. We've got blue is nearest, for example, green is near cam, and the dashed lines are both near spec, but with different gradings. So we've got these four different observing modes, that means we have to observe four different transits, but then we get these wonderful, overlapping, redundant observations where we can assess the performance of the different instrument modes by looking at that overlap. We can figure out which ones are the best behaved. We can investigate systematic errors and the like. And of course, with near spec, no, sorry, nearest, um, we get broad wavelength coverage by getting two orders that are simultaneously observed in the same readout. And I'm bringing that up because those two, oops, sorry, those two orders actually converge over here and overlap. So the extraction is going to be complicated. That's something we want to figure out how to do. Okay, the second part of the program is the MIRI phase curve program. This is looking at WASP 43 as it orbits its star and you see different sides of the planet, different faces, different amounts of thermal emission as the day side comes into view. It shows both a primary transit and a secondary occultation. All of that contains a lot of information that allows you to get the phase-dependent spectrum and look at the temperature pro pressure profile as a function of longitude. 
Um, so Olivia Vinot has been working really hard on this. She has an updated paper, actually, magnificent paper that's just been submitted where she looks at the real nuts and bolts of all the modeling, what we can and can't say based on the modeling, what happens when you include cloud formation and all the microphysics of particles, particles of different sizes, equilibrium processes, non-equilibrium processes, different cloud compositions, all of that is investigated. Um, and she makes several conclusions in that paper about what we're going to be able to um, observe, including a strong case for being able to detect non-equilibrium or disequilibrium chemistry. The third and final test is very short. It's to observe the brightest star possible in order to really see what the instrument is capable of down at the noise floor. And that's an observation of WASP-18 in its secondary eclipse. And here's a simulation showing how you will be able to distinguish between these two very different temperature, profi temperature pressure profiles, um, something that you could not disambiguate with HST observations alone. Okay. Uh, the centerpiece of the ERS program is a data challenge that'll be open to the public. Um, it's two phase. In the first phase, the first part of the data challenge is to exercise tools on simulated data. This will happen after web launches, but during the commissioning period. So it'll be before we actually get our observations from web. So people will come together, we will have super secret simulated data with systematic errors, or no, the, it's the systematic errors that are super secret, not the data, not the simulated data. Um, we'll give it to the community, they'll run it through their tools, and then they'll compare the output to see how well they do. Um, okay, and then the second part will follow about six months later once we have our data in hand. Data challenge number two is operating fine, fine-tuned tools on the actual data, leading to Jupyter notebooks that will be pushed out to the public for analyzing data, giving you examples of how to go from raw data to extracted spectrum and retrieval of atmospheric properties. Because launch was delayed, we actually were able to get a little more funding from Space Telescope Science Institute for uh, an interim program, and that's what we're calling the boot camp that's going to happen next summer in 2020. We don't have a date yet, we, but we expect it to be somewhere around this midsummer. And at the boot camp, the idea of the boot camp is to promote open source tools for data analysis and preparation for the data challenge. So if you have tools and if you're willing to make them open source and you would like to teach early career scientists how to use your tools, um, this would be a great forum for that. Those are the goals of the boot camp. Okay, and finally, um, just a little bit about looking forward. So it's great, we've got this early science release program. We're going to observe three hot Jupiters. So what? Okay, we'll get, we'll get a great C to O ratio, a great metallicity, um, but surely the science yield of Webb must be greater than just postage stamp collecting of hot Jupiter atmospheres, right? Um, this was recognized early on by the broader community and has been the subject of numerous white papers, panel discussions, exopeg presentations, and the community gave a strong message to the National Academy of Sciences, basically saying, and to Space Telescope, saying basically the community needs to coordinate efforts and Space Telescope needs to come up with a legacy-like program so that we can do a comprehensive, well thought out survey of exoplanet atmospheres that speaks to the demographics and the diversity of exoplanet atmospheres. Um, so that recommendation was actually put forward in the National Academy of Science Exoplanet Strategy Report and Space Telescope took it to heart. I'm on the, <clears throat> the web users committee and we've already started talking about how to implement such a legacy program. So I do think it's going to happen. So, <clears throat> But do we have the targets? Yes, we do, because the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, launched about a year ago, is doing what Kepler did in the form of an all-sky survey. Uh, they just are now completing the survey of the southern hemisphere, 
Um, you see in the movie how the strategy of observing works. Um, you observe longitude strips, 90 to, almost 90 degrees in span for about 27 days, clock over, take another longitude strip, do that for one year over the southern hemisphere, then you flip and do the, the northern hemisphere the following year. So we've almost got, I think in the repository, we have nine sectors, candidates from nine out of the 13 sectors from the southern hemisphere. So that presents itself as a great sample for now starting to think about this legacy program. So I wanted to share a few slides about this. First, I can take a simulated catalog, a simulation of the exoplanets that TESS is expected to find. And this was generated by Tom Barkley in 2018 and his collaborators. And what I'm trying to do is pick the best planets from that simulated sample that uniformly, as best as possible, uniformly sample both planet and star properties, and simultaneously yield the requisite precision on the web instruments for atmospheric characterization. So that's what this diagram represents for the candidates in, well, at declinations greater than 20 degrees. So kind of the stars that you'd be able to observe from Keck, let's say. I put in one other requirement, and that's this, that the velocity semi-amplitude is predicted to be more than two meters per second. I'll talk about that more in a second. So then what I do is, well, I took the sample. To arrive at this plot, I took the entire sample, which is about 4,000 planet candidates. I applied these criteria. Then I bend the parameter space, and I rank ordered and computed quantiles to get the best candidates in each bin. And that's basically what this looks like. Um, I've got spectral type bins, insulation flux bins, and five radius bins across this space. And then I sample the best atmospheric targets from each of those bins, um, trying to achieve at least three exoplanets in each of those categories. And you can see sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. For example, in the upper left-hand corner, we're not successful, there's nothing there. That's a sensitivity bias. We, we don't detect planets, tiny planets, at low insulation flux, well, planets at low insulation flux around the, around the hottest stars. And at the bottom right-hand corner, there aren't any planets. That's an occurrence rate bias. There are not uh, such hot planets around M dwarfs, for example. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, but that's, kind of our, that's where we're at. That's our scenario. Um, that's what we have to work with. So as I mentioned, I can do better than just the simulated uh, population. I can actually look at the test candidates in sectors one through nine, and I apply the same criteria, and this is what I get. I have about half of the yield so far. Uh, that's a little lower than I would have expected based on the simulation, because we've collected about 70% of the data, or analyzed about 70% of the data. But it's still a nice sample to get busy on. Um, I can also compare this test candidates to the previously known or the already confirmed planets. And I just want to mention this because we do have in the Exoplanet Archive a lot of planets that are good atmospheric targets as well. And we shouldn't um, throw the baby out with the bathwater and forget about them. So together, they actually have uniquely different populations in some parts of parameter space. Okay, um, I've already mentioned this, so did Mike. I'm gonna skip. Um, we are, this is important. This is the, the money plot here. So um, Ty already mentioned that it's important to have the planet masses and the radii because there's a degeneracy between the surface gravity and the mean molecular weight. And you can't do accurate retrievals if you don't, if you can't disambiguate that. So we need the masses, and that's why I put in the velocity greater than two meter per second criteria. These candidates are no good unless they have transit timing variations or we can get a Doppler map. But it's 
you, you, you want to actually model that and say, okay, well, where, where in parameter space are these masses super valuable? And so Natasha is leading this study. She and I are working on this together, looking at a range of planet types to understand what precision of mass you need in order to do an accurate retrieval. Um, and the conclusion is 20% for, uh, for Neptunes and smaller, less important for hot Jupiters. Um, so those are my takeaway messages, and maybe we'll have time for one question. Yeah, we okay, will. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the youngest old person. Um, what's the, do you know the reason for the difference between the pre predicted uh, Great question. So we would expect 70% of the yield by way of not having analyzed yet, or at least releasing sectors 10 through 13. That's not going to account for it. I think it could be related to the fact that we haven't done a full multi-sector run to get all of the longer period planets. So the multi-sector run, that is where you combine all the sectors and you look at the overlap region. Yes. I, I'm not sure that's going to explain it all, but um, yeah. Look, and it's only going to get worse too because there are false positives amongst that sample. They haven't been confirmed yet. Yeah. Real, real quick, uh, and you probably don't have anything to ask already. Why, why did you cut off the pod of 6,500 Kelvin for your second jump from the stars? Because there are some, there are some planets that are orbit outer stars than that. Yeah, I think even WASP 79 is one of them. So, um, no reason. I, I actually am looking all the way up to 10,000 degrees. Yeah, just for, for a nice display. Okay, well, we're going to show us back, Natalie. Thank you.